into this subject, kind of bring it up to date, where it is globally and in the world, and then I guess we can decide collectively if this status quo, what we have now, is or is not a problem of some kind that needs somebody's attention on. First thing I want to do, though, is give a salute to classic elements, because it's here where they celebrate all of the classic elements. And this is one in this picture, of course. Here's another one. We've had this one just here for the music. Another one would be art, and then literature, books, of course, are celebrated here. Something that's very important now that we have this anti-book thing going on in some parts of our world. <clears throat> and of course, I think the classic element of all classic elements is dialogue about subjects of interest and to model how to do that in some civil way um, through open-minded discussion of critical issues. So I guess Rodin uh, thought about illustrating this first. Some background, because all of us come to issues like this from whatever perspective we, we bring, whatever we have, uh, whatever experience. I'm a biologist by background and training. These are some of my first books. They're all out of print now, so you can't run to the bookstore and buy them. <laughs> They're really old. The Dimensions of Cancer, that was published back in the 90s. And Sights and Sounds in the 80s, a book on vision and hearing. And I also did one on environmental science, which was based on a health perspective on the environment. But these books, these are actually on sale back here at the bookstore. Uh, one on morality. And the theme here, even in these books that are available here today, is still biology. What, I, what I've done in my semi-retirement is I've kind of gotten interested in the edge of where biology meets everything else. And one of those areas is religion. One of, the, one of them is uh, uh, morality, broadly, more broadly speaking. Now, this is a work of science fiction that's really on the same kind of a, a theme, and it's the idea that morality came to us through biological evolution, and not because it's written in, in a book, although that is another source of uh, morality, but it came to us through biological evolution because we're a social species, and unless we're moral in our behavior toward one another, well, it's not going to work. And then finally, this one, uh, which is my latest book, uh, work of historical fiction. Uh, if my assistant will hold a copy of the, up there, the real book, <laughs> that, that I'll be giving to someone today. The first person that comes up after the talk and says, I'll take it. And I will read it, and I will write a review somewhere. I'll give you some number of stars from zero to five. I don't care how many. If you have to agree, I'll do that, do the review. Okay? And it's a signed copy, by the way, too. Okay, so the topic, poverty and privilege. Uh, <clears throat> I think one of the first times I really began to hear the word poverty spoken <clears throat> was back in, during the administration of uh, Lyndon Johnson and the so-called war on poverty. Some people today point out that it was a dismal failure because Technically, there are more people living in poverty today than there were then. The others, others would say, well, it's only because we keep raising the, we keep raising the standard for poverty by inflation, and we're overestimating uh, the effect of inflation on poverty. But I'm not going to quibble over that here today. Um, you can see on the map over there that we are actually part of. Appalachia, which was the focus for the war on poverty. We're that little green county there in Pennsylvania. I think you all know where it is. The hot spot, of course, was eastern Kentucky, where the <clears throat> Delaware spent some 25 years in Kentucky. So we are familiar with the uh, situation there. Next slide. 
some definitions. That I mentioned that one of the problems with has the war on poverty succeeded depends on what the definition of poverty was then and what it is now. And there's no single definition. It's all over the place. Every federal agency that serves people seems to have its own definition. They all, they all kind of hover around maybe halfway between the median income, this is about income now, poverty by that way, and zero. So halfway to the median is thought to be, or said to be, the poverty line. And I want to make the distinction between inequity and inequality. Uh, inequality means not equal. There's nothing wrong with that. It's the, it's the, it's the order of the universe. Things are rarely equal. Um, but inequity means they're different and it's not right. For some reason, it's too large. Um, so you can consider inequity and think of it this way. It's kind of like iniquity. It's a bad thing sometimes. But inequality is not necessarily. Uh, so it's a fact of life and will always likely be. Next, poverty can be something that's absolute. You don't have enough food to eat. You don't have a place to stay. You don't have clothing. Or it can be relative poverty. I've already suggested how that is with the different federal agencies that serve people in some state of uh, poverty. Next. <clears throat> You're like, well, you did that, Shia. Uh, so it's not just income, of course. It's the effect of not having income that gives people uh, housing, uh, housing, clothing, food, insecurity. Environmental quality is a problem. If you don't have enough money where you live and what you have to put up with, uh, opportunity is not always equal. Health care status and safety are not always equal. These are the things that come from money. And the latest one, uh, that we seem to have gotten more interested in lately is uh, political power. And you all know the Supreme Court just a short while ago declared that money is the same as speech. And therefore you can't limit the amount of money spent by some uh, on politics. Uh, and so it's raised the issue, of course, immediately that, well, does that mean the more money you have, the more power you have? And therefore, it does become inequitable as well as unequal, because now you can influence uh, how people actually come by money, uh, because you have more of it. So an issue. Next. <clears throat> There's a lot of poverty in the world, and you've all seen these pictures. But I thought it would be good just to see them again, and we're going to go through them quickly. There are some. Um, next, most of the world's people, 85%, that means uh, it's, we're going to use the number 8 billion people in the world. So 85% eight, of 8 billion people live on less than $30 a day. If you're the sole wage earner in your family and you're making the minimum wage, you bring home about $60 a day, minimum wage, $7.25 times 8, 8 hour a day. So if you're the only wage earner, your family is twice uh, that level of 85% uh, there. Half of the world's people live on less than 550, and there are 1.3 billion people in our world who live on less than $1.90 a day. This is what the UN uses as its definition of extreme poverty, $1.90 a day for the world. Yeah. <clears throat> 750 million people as a consequence of all that lack adequate clean water. There are 270 million kids that have no access to health care whatsoever. None. Nowhere to go. No clinics. Nothing. 270 million. That's only a fraction, of course, of 8 billion people. Children would make up maybe 22, 25 percent of that uh, total. Next. Nearly a billion people entered the 21st century unable to read or write. One out of eight people in the world cannot read or write. Next. That's a consequence, of course, of income and economic opportunity. <clears throat> We're not going to get into this today, but because of all of this inequity and this low amount of uh, economic uh, power that people have, there's a whole area of sex trafficking and other ways of exploiting children and people throughout the world as a result of this the fact that we have so much inequity in our 
uh, world next. Poorest countries of the world, there they are. Somalia has $4.47 in gross domestic product per person. <clears throat> you can see at the bottom, the US has about 70. We're ninth on the list of world countries in uh, GDP per person. Okay, so countries like Monaco, quarter of a million per person. There are eight more that are ahead of us. And then the world average is about $18,000 in gross domestic product per person in that country. You know, most, as you would expect, most of the countries in the world are actually in Africa. The Middle East has a few yeah, also. Next. So world poverty, it's, a, it's an issue. And it's, you see it on your television screens almost every day. Next. Next. In developing countries, there are 152 of those. There are 198 countries in the world, they say. 152 of them are called developing. That means they're not there yet. <laughs> Whatever that means exactly, of course, is subject to some interpretation. But <clears throat> people in those countries spend about almost 80% of their money for food. Here, we spend about uh, 10 or less. Next. 800 million people in the world are hungry right now. Tonight, today. 800 million, that's one out of 10. Next, moral, and of course, more than three million children die from malnutrition per year, according to the United Nations. <clears throat> three million people would be roughly the whole, all the kids in Pennsylvania. There are about mm -hmm. three million kids here. Yeah. So, Three million uh, die from malnutrition. Uh, num number of people living on that dollar ninety day. This is a trend uh, point here. Right before the COVID hit, we were doing better. Uh, the, the number of people living on a dollar ninety was coming up. Uh, more than a dollar ninety was coming up. But then, but, but that wasn't all it looked like either. Because while that was happening, <clears throat> inequity was getting even bigger. As the people at the top were. <coughs> Still, we're making more than, we're gaining more than that was gaining. But then when COVID hit, it got bigger and the number of people uh, in extreme poverty in 2020, for the first time over 20 years, it actually uh, dropped because of the conflicts and the issues associated with the climate change and COVID. Next. <clears throat> So in the world, kind of a, in a summary way, the richest 1% hold more wealth than all the other people in the world combined. 1% of the world's population, of course, would be 1% of 8 million. It's a large number of people, right? But they have more wealth than all of the others in the world combined, all of the other 99. The world's richest 42 people in 2018 held, had more wealth than the world's poorest, 3.7 billion people, just 42. Roughly 80% of the wealth generated throughout the world last year went to just 1% of the people. Over the next 20 years, 500 of the world's richest people will give 2.4 trillion to their heirs, according to the, this is the, the World Bank and several different sources. Um, by the way, that amount of money, 2.4 trillion, um, is about the GDP of India. It's a, it's a big, number. I was always shocked, I'm mean, always shocked when I think of what a big number a trillion is and how few of us ever really let it sink in how big a number that is. And the one, the one that I like is a trillion seconds ago, it was 30,000 BC. <laughs> a trillion seconds ago, 30,000 BC, kind of the right between the early and mid Stone Age. Okay. You can do the math, you know, not 60 seconds in every minute, and just do it. A trillion is a big number. Next. There's a new billionaire in the world every two days, and we now have over 3,000 of them, according to the recent figures. <coughs> and during COVID and since COVID, billionaire wealth uh, went up by 13% for everybody else, it went up 2%. There's more of this, the rich get richer, the spread gets bigger. Next. 
the wealth distribution held by the top 10% in Europe, the Middle East, USA, China, and Russia is shown here. That is to say, the top 10% of the people in all those countries, uh, in those countries, have the percentage of the wealth. This is wealth now. It's not just income, annual income. This is accumulated total wealth. Okay. Next. And there's poverty in America. Next. These pictures you probably have also seen, but we try to not think about this here in America. We're a rich country, we don't have this, and if we do, those are bad people, and most, most Americans think of them, we don't want to think about that. But they do exist. Uh, we, I have seen a lot of these scenes personally over my lifetime, and I'm sure many of you have as well. Uh, we have poverty here in America, next, some real poverty where people don't have enough to eat, no place to sleep, no real access to high quality health care, maybe a free clinic um, next. Um, and when I was doing the research on this, one of the things that really struck me was a statistic that I began to think about during COVID when we had people in middle class, then in the middle class, who were all of a sudden disenfranchised from the economic system and they had no reserve. So they're in lines to go to the food banks during the COVID. Many of you, I'm sure most of you saw these pictures. But here's the, here's the kicker in the next slide. 67%, 69% of urban Americans live paycheck to paycheck. That means, that means if your paycheck stops, unless you stash something away, and they didn't, that's what it means to live paycheck to paycheck. You don't have the reserve. 69%. Wow. That's here in, in America. Forbes and Fortune are the sources for that <laughs> statistic. Next. And then I'm not going to really have time tonight to get into, in my introduction, things like the disparity in health care. This is the Mayo Clinic. On the right, this is a free clinic here. Huge uh, disparity in access to health care. Next, uh, and of course that means lifespan is much reduced uh, among people in even relative uh, poverty. Next slide. <clears throat> Here's two single family homes right there. <laughs> uh, this one I think is in Florida. Uh, next. And here in the United States, inequality slash inequity, you decide. Uh, the lowest fifth of our people have 3.1% of all income now. And I'm mixing these up, I know, because we only have a short time. Income and wealth are two different things. Income is what you get as an annual thing, and then wealth is what you're able to accumulate over time. <clears throat> so the top 5% has a quarter of all of the uh, um, income stream in this country. Next. If you're interested in where we rank on, in terms of inequity uh, or inequality, I guess, in this slide, we're, we're second to China in this list. And I, I'm not going to really get into it unless somebody has a question later about this Gini coefficient. It's a measure of how much inequality there is in a population. How much how much of the total do the really rich have versus the not so rich versus the poor? And it's an interesting mathematical thing that involves some calculus. But so that's why I didn't want to go there, probably because I wouldn't be able to explain it clearly and I don't even understand it clearly myself sometimes. Next. Uh, another issue tied to this, of course, is racial inequality. This is a graph showing racial inequality in the United States. Um, I think there was one on TV just as I was uh, getting ready this afternoon that said how much more wealth white families have than black families in America. And there's a, there's a, uh, a picture that you can see there. <clears throat> this is over time, from 83 to 2024. Obviously, the last part is a projection. But these are white families, red or black, and the brown Latino. And then that graph over there, you see that? I apologize because it's a little complicated, but it says if you take people who were in uh, all at the same place, or relatively in the same place, 
Um, in, I think it was 1943 to 51. I was born in 53 to 41. And this is how their wealth developed over time since then. Mm -hmm. So the point is, the uh, white and uh, black is a completely different story. Mm -hmm. So it's another issue here in our country that has to do with this one that we're talking about today. Next. <coughs> And all of that, by the way, is collaborates uh, other sources of tested this proposition that it's not equal. <laughs> um, it's not even close to being equal, and therefore the suggestion is maybe it isn't, maybe it's inequitable as well. Next. And then this thing about money makes money, or it takes money to make money. No matter what group you're in, I thought this was a really interesting slide. The more you have, the better you do over time, no matter what group you're in. So it's, a, it's kind of a proof of money makes money no matter what. You know? um, next. And then I'm going to dwell on this one just a minute because it does what that other slide would have done if we had more time to stare at it, I guess. But if you look at real average after tax and after transfer income, this is after people pay their taxes and after the transfer income is given or is assigned to the people who are getting a, a, a subsidy of some kind, housing or funding, either one. So in 1970, uh, the bottom 50% made had on the average income $2,018, just under $20,000 for that year. By 2018, which was so many years later, Blair, 48, almost 50 years, uh, it's 27,642. So not even close to doubling, right? Not even. Mm -hmm. Now go to the top 10 to, uh, 10 to 1 percent, they, they had 91,404 in income after taxes and after the transfer. But 50 years later, that income was 187,478. So, roughly a doubling, right? So go over to the other, all the way to the other end that you see, and this makes the point all the way across. The top 0.01% had 3.7 million in income. Chai and needs to step 20, away for a second. Pardon? Okay, Chaya needs to step away to let me out, sorry. Okay. <laughs> So is this clear, the point that this is making here? If, if you start out with three million in income, that group has 24 million in uh, 2018, which seems to me it's like seven, eight, six, seven, eight times more uh, money more income. So that's that's the pattern that you see. Uh, I think you went the right way. The three richest Americans have more wealth than the entire bottom half of the American population. Another way of expressing that. Next. Elon Musk. Yep. <laughs> three people. The entire bottom half of the population. So this, it takes money to make money, political power, grossly uneven. Um, and I'm here to tell you it's not fair. It's also inequitable. Uh, this was an example here. Airbnb went as a, as a stock uh, business uh, a couple of years ago. And that happens overnight. I mean, the big banks uh, get the uh, shares to sell. So on, on day one, when this, that stock was available, only the big institutional investors had access to it. Okay. So what do they do? They buy one of the stock. Now I admit there's a little risk to doing that, but in this case there was hardly any. You know, we kind of knew where this was all going. But nobody else can buy the stock that day. You can buy it the next day. Okay. And of course by then the stock um, went up. And those people that in those institutions that bought the stock on day one earned 3.9 billion in the sale of stock wow. the following day. They did nothing to do it other than have the money. 
and be willing to take that risk, however small it might have been. So there's a lot of this built into our mm -hmm. system. This is just one example, I'm sure those of you here would know of others. Legal and illegal <laughs> corruption both. Next. CEOs now make 360 times what the average worker makes here in the mm -hmm. country. It's a new statistic. I don't know. Maybe that's fair, maybe not. Uh, it doesn't seem right to some of us, some people. Um, 360 times more. Next. And then uh, the, uh, first we've all known and heard about the demise of the middle class. This is an illustration of that. Now this goes from 1970 to the 2015, this particular slide, which you can see how that middle class has been shrinking. The share of all of the uh, household income in constant dollars. And today, that uh, percentage of high income, $100,000 or more, today that number is 34%, almost 35%. So it's key, it continues to get larger. Next, what happened to the middle class? Well, that. And there's what's projected to happen in the next few years with our middle, so called middle class. Um, been downhill for a long time. Next, this shows a correlation between union membership and, um, and a middle class. Now, correlation doesn't prove cause and effect, of course, we all know that. Still, it's kind of interesting that they run pretty close together. Uh, and you've heard it said, I'm sure I have, that the middle class came about because of unions back when they were much stronger than they are, a much bigger part of our economic fabric than they are today. Next. <laughs> so, the causes of this increase in equity, demise of unions, technology, jobs to Mexico and China, global competition, uh, fixed the minimum wage over a long period of time. It's still, still here in Pennsylvania, I think, $7.25 an hour. That's the federal minimum wage, and Pennsylvania doesn't add anything to it. So I, the rest of my t presentation here is about, I want to give you something to think about. Like, okay, why, why, why might this be a problem? And if you look around the world today, our world, where we live, right here, and watch television, I mean, we've never seen such divisiveness. We've never seen people so upset with government, with uh, the institutions, with questioning everything from the FBI to, uh, people are mad, they're angry. And I'm submitting, I'm gonna, my point is, this is one of the reasons. Now, we, we've always thought about, if people get, if it gets to be too inequitable, there's a revolution, okay, that happens. Mm -hmm. It happened in France, this was the Bastille, uh, in the, at the end of the uh, 1700s. It happened in Russia in 1917. The whole country was turned upside down and we will start over. It happened there, and of course, we, we think about this. And it's, it explains why we have a government that's been attentive to, we gotta make sure people have at least some support, because if they don't have any, they're gonna come and get it. They're gonna come and take it. So we have to make sure, uh, and you see that a lot in our policies over the last century or so, back to the middle of the 1800s here in this country. So there's that. But there's also what we're experiencing now. And my point is, a lot of people are angry because of this income. Uh, disparity of this inequity. And I'm going to give you some examples of a couple of studies that, have, that, that kind of make this point. Next. Well, by the way, uh, John Steinbeck wrote this book. Cindy, I'm sure you've read it. Yes. Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> and in that, the Grapes of Wrath, where the phrase comes from, it has to do with revolution. The next slide, next to slide, is the quote uh, In the eyes of the hungry, there's a growing wrath. In the souls of the people, the grapes of wrath are filling and growing heavy, growing heavy for the vintage. The vintage of the grapes of wrath, of course, whatever comes from this pent up anger. Next. Social tension when people don't have enough to eat, when they don't have a place to sleep, and even if they don't have a feel good place in the grand social scheme. The first two parts of this, you'd probably say, well, yeah, but my point's gonna be about this last part here. If you don't feel like you have a good place in the grand social scheme, you are unhappy. You may not know how to express it. 
it may come out as all kinds of nasty <laughs> forms, but you're not happy with the status quo and you don't blame yourself. You say, look, I'm a human being too. I deserve better. I don't understand why this is happening to me. <laughs> and you get very <coughs> angry. And that's, that's how I'm gonna end with this. Um, it's in society's best interest to have a place, a way to earn a decent living, a respectable part to play, and nobody's left out. I'm gonna make this point several times. Next. I already made that one. Uh, poverty is the parent of revolution and crime, but it's also the parent of some other stuff. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna emphasize it again. Next. It's a problem of everybody. This is why kind of folks have gone along with it. Let's help the poor at least a little bit. Uh, because, you know, if you don't, it's, it's, a, it's the, it's the, uh, it's, it's the source of crime, disease, blight, riots, uh, insurrection, extremism, and homelessness. And we all suffer when we have this, but no matter how much money we have, that you can find an enclave somewhere mm -hmm. to keep away mm -hmm. from it all. It's going to affect everybody. Next. We are built, as a, as a biologist I know, we human beings as social animals are built to need to be in on whatever our group is up to. We want to belong. We want to have status within our big group. We don't want to be also ranked. A couple of studies. Next, please. I'm out of this book right here, and I, I recommend it to you. It's called The Broken Ladder. And it is all about how inequality affects how we think, how we live, and how we die. So it gets into you know, the, the, the death rates among those who are poor, but also how people think and how they live today. And I'm going to cite a couple of studies that he, that he cites in this book now, and end with those next. Oh, this is a kind of a footnote. This is also kind of a side note that <clears throat> another book about ladders had to do with, with gender inequity. It's another topic. But it is about how the lower rungs of the ladder in business are not really available to women because they're, they tend not to get into the, into the game early. They, they, they have children, so they take care of those in the beginning. And they miss out on those early runs, and therefore they have no way to get going. Kind of another, another topic, but a related one, because it has to do with this metaphor of the ladder. Next. This was a study of people, not long ago there was a news item about a woman who was causing a riot on an airplane. She stood up and yelled at some kids and started a fight and then the police had to take her off and she went to jail. And then we started hearing more about these fights on airplanes and planes having to land somewhere before they got to where they were going because it was a fight. Well, somebody did a study that said, you know what happens if people walk onto an, they, they, they did a measurement of the frequency of disturbances on airplane, on flights where people in coach had to walk through first class. Then they compared that to fights, the rate of fights on planes that didn't have first class. Then, and compared it, we compared that to the rate of fights on airplanes where there was a side door. You know, some planes have two doors, or you come in, you go that way to first class, this way to, uh, to uh, coach. And lo and behold, there's a, there was a tight <laughs> correlation. Again, it doesn't prove anything, but it suggests that just walking through uh, a group of people that are way better off than you, seeing it boldly in that kind of circumstance, not like you know, the other clues you get that are a little more obscure day to day, but uh, just having to walk through that makes people angry. Mm -hmm. Is a suggestion that might come out of the study like that one. Next. So here are the United States of America arrayed by their inequity. Okay. Uh, inequality, I guess it's, I should say in this case. But you'll see it's kind of hard to know where one stops and the other starts. Uh, New York is the most unequal state. The closer you can get to uh, uh, 
to one in this Gini system, the more inequitable it is. The, the most equitable states are Utah and Alaska, and you can see where the other kind of fit. Now that's really not the important thing. The important thing is they took each of these states, ranked them from most inequitable to least. And, and, and the, the implication is that you're, you're seeing what people might feel like in those states where inequity is high and uh, where it's actually low. And then we're gonna look at we're going to look at social dysfunction. And we're going to look at certain measures of social dysfunction. Next slide. People in the states that are inequitable tended to have shorter lifespans. They had tended to have illnesses derived from risky behavior. They tended to have more teenage births, more school dropouts, and less economic mobility. And again, I will acknowledge correlation doesn't prove cause and effect. However, it does suggest that something needs further examination. Next. I don't need to tell you this. Feeling relatively poor is about the same as actually being poor in terms of your mindset. You can be made to feel poor even if you're tend you tend to be well up. And I think about this a lot. Here we are in a world at a time when it's never been better by lots of measures. I mean, health care, availability of food and housing, uh, just, just even going back as far as the, you know, the Great Depression and the, and the overcrowding there was in New York when all the immigrants were first starting to come here. <clears throat> um, it's, it's a lot better today, but we don't feel like it is for some reason. And maybe this is some of the reason. Next. What inequality does in another study, that's a summary study, said below a certain, below the 20th percentile in income. There's more anxiety, more depression, something must be wrong with me, sense of losing, moving backward. Next. It makes people short-sighted, they, they look for short-term payoffs, gratification, they buy lottery tickets, they opt for high-risk behavior, gamble, binge drinking, eating. We, we lived for a while in North Dakota. We had a uh, uh, lots of occasion to go to visit reservations in North Dakota. One of them was the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, which is said to be the poorest county in the United States. <laughs> Everybody there seemed to be overweight. Uh, and you wonder, well, how are they managing to do that, and why would they do that? Well, this, this sort of explains it, I guess. Uh, it fits, anyway, with this these data that you see here. Self-defeating decisions, and, they, and people tend to believe in the supernatural. I'm looking for, I'm not gonna be, this is, there's a lot of, a lot in, inside that one, but it's not just about organized religion, it's about things like um, reincarnation and astrology and, and all of the supernatural things, ghosts, witches, um, the whole nine yard. Um, people thinking, well, and even among the religious, it said, you know, if I can't get, if I can't get justice here, I have to have. A, there's got to be a place where I will. So they tend to, <laughs> tend to gravitate toward that way of thinking. And then finally, finally, the way forward. I want to leave you just hanging. Here's some three different sources of suggestions about what do we do about this. And it does presume that there's a reason to do something, and that the answer is, well, that's tough. People are unequal, they always will be. Not my problem, right? That's one way to look at this. But if it is the problem, here are some ways people have suggested we move forward next. And I want you to have this image in your head. We've learned about gold bars lately from uh, what's happened to Senator Menendez, Menendez right? He's got the value of a bar of gold, $64,000 roughly. <clears throat> that was when I made this picture. And of course, the value of that gold, next slide, is zero if there are no other people around who don't want it, don't happen to want it for some reason, like to make gold pendants to give their girlfriends or make rings from it. So that guy, if he had a gold bar, it would be worth nothing to him unless he were to make uh, little weights maybe to make a net. He could use it to go fishing and that would be about it. 
it would have no value whatsoever otherwise. It takes a society that's functional for all the wealth that we have, no matter who has it, to be wealth. Somebody else has to want it before it's valuable. You get what I mean. Just keep that image of the gold bar in your, in your head. And then next. We have to make sure everybody has a place. Mandatory public schooling kind of gets at that. Public higher education, parental care standards, workforce training, little league and scouts, curriculum standards, mentoring and internships, next. Um, policies we need so that nobody falls below the bottom, progressive taxation, transfer payments, <coughs> housing subsidies, we have all these. The United States is today probably the just out of the top 10 most socialist countries in the world. We, we all know that. Our, our uh, budget for welfare type programs is in the order of a trillion, two trillion dollars. We're, we're, we've been, we recognize this as a country. Next. Jamie Dimon, who is the Chase Bank uh, CEO, and I think is, a, is probably a conservative, had an article in, in Time not long ago, How to Save Capitalism, and he, here are, here are his points and you can read them. Bring everybody in, more inclusive, provide more and better skills training, affordable health care, infrastructure investments. Everybody has a way to prosper, a foundation for prospering. Next, this was Payne, the guy who wrote the book on the ladder. He says, we need to compress the ladder. You have to make all the rungs on the ladder equally accessible to people with similar ability regardless of their race and where they came from. We have to establish a respectable bottom. This is where that talk about the minimum basic income, if a lot of us have trouble understanding why would we ever do that, give somebody a basic income. Well, if you, if you tie it to you, you have to do some work too. Uh, it becomes much more sensible than thinking of somebody's gonna stay at home and eat bonbons and we're gonna, we're gonna subsidize them anyway. <clears throat> More rational CEO salaries and benefits. No missing runs or level, and there have to be letter, levels on all the ladders where, lots of, where people can say, I'm, this, I'm gonna go this high and no higher, but you know what, I'm happy. I can, I can get all I want out of life right here. I don't need to go any further, next. And then I would add these, term limits for congressmen and senators. Uh, revamp campaign finance, what we do now is ridiculous, it's absurd. More progressive tax rates on extreme income disparity. Uh, extended earned income tax credit program, which conservatives as well as liberals tend to like because it requires that you, you have a job to get that credit. You have a job that doesn't pay enough. And then raising the minimum wage, which is long overdue uh, here in other places. Next. I don't know what the minimum wage should be. I'd be interested to know what you all think. Seven and a quarter an hour seems low. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me if you have a full-time job, nobody should be in poverty. Make they work job. all the time. Make it so life literally in the pursuit of happiness, I get that. It's not that you're guaranteed happiness, but you're guaranteed the pursuit, to be able to pursue it. And therefore, it has to be a good and fair chance. Next. And thank you all for your attention. I'm going to now open the discussion for your comments and thoughts about this. Uh, remember, the book free and available to whoever says I'll take it. The floor is open. Thank you. Very much. I agree with you on term limits. You know what? When the when the um, government was going to be shut down and all the military wouldn't get paid, but all of Congress would. Something's wrong with that. You know, a lot of us who, who feel that's way overdue the term. We've done it for the presidency, and you have to think, well, why not? <laughs> for those other guys, and they, should, they prove every day why we need to have those. Yeah. They get in mm -hmm. in those roles, and they spend all their time making sure they get reelected. And we'll give away whatever it takes to get reelected. Larry? You didn't mention as one of the possible solutions uh, the, the use a wealth tax. 
you know, Elizabeth Warren and others have suggested that you know, have a wealth tax. Yes, I did mention that, but I instead of it. passing, it was a more equitable truncation of the top income. So, whether so it's, many words, yeah. You whether it's a it. tax on wealth or you, it's progressive all the way to the end. Uh, yes, that's been said a lot. Well. Yeah. I mean, it was recently reported that, uh, you know, I guess the child income tax credit was expanded during the pandemic and lifted a lot of children out of poverty, but now they're falling back into poverty now since it's been, since it's been, since they ended it, you know, they pulled the rug out from under them. Yeah, it would, it's trying to get at, and I said when I mentioned it, that conservatives and liberals both like that tax, that income uh, tax credit system because it's kind of a negative income tax. If you don't make enough money, you get, you get some extra money to keep you off the floor. Yeah. But you had to have a job. You had to have a job to qualify. And even when, you know, you hear people revolt, just get re revolted by this idea of a basic income, <coughs> they always think of, well, they're not going to have to work at all. But obviously there's a way to tie these things together if it's done right. There'll always be, there'll always be those outliers, but you can't use that to decide what you're going to do. Uh, you have to deal with the extremes in some other way. I'm yes. curious how we could mandate or arrange for CEO to give up the huge salaries. <laughs> Exploited workers, they did. If you look at history, but they took the money they had. They built libraries with them. Today we have these guys, and not like um, Warren uh, Buffett. Yeah, Buffett. They're, they're, they're building rockets and so oh, Elon Musk. Have lots of money in the space and playing with it. That's mm -hmm. Bezos. That's Bezos and Musk are building rockets. Yeah, not, not, not Buffett. <laughs> Yeah, Buffett doesn't work. He's doing money away. Yeah, I'm not excluding him. But there, uh, mm -hmm. We have this trouble with others that yeah. don't seem to be anything like Andrew Carnegie in that positive sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the answer to that is. Why uh, a CEO would do that, um, would take that, except, you know, in capitalism, raw, the thing is worth whatever you can get for it. That's it. That's the value system we have. Look at uh, uh, Taylor Swift or <laughs> people making billions of dollars because, well, they, they can. That's what they can charge. The thing is worth whatever you can get for it. But maybe we, we change or try to change the value system before the policies. How do you do that? <laughs> yes. How do we do that? That's you know, that's that's a person by person choice. It's a, it's a parenting choice. So. Would you go back to that gold bar there for just a minute on this value question? I remember a couple of years ago when when Obama was president, <clears throat> he challenged somebody who was a rich somebody who said, "I did this all by myself." Remember? Yeah. Have you ever heard that? And that raised all kinds of holy hell. I was like, well, no, you didn't. I mean, look at the gold bar thing. You, you, you had to have all this other infrastructure, <laughs> infrastructure that lets you do that. And you, you had to have lots of other people who were very relatively well off so they could compete for these resources, actually gave value to what you had. But yet, there are those whose values say, I did that all by myself, and they actually believe they did. I don't know anything to the government for building roads or 
protecting me through the military or having police or schools. I shouldn't have to pay school taxes. My kids are all grown up. You know, that yeah. kind of stuff. We're, we're, yeah. we're just disengaged from the social well, there's that hyper individualism that it's all about the person and you started off to talk about morality and I think you know changing the conversation in, in, in the best ways we can towards the collective and the greater good um, is part of that shift yeah and I guess that it's something that maybe will come but it's like it's obviously very slow in coming and it's going to yeah, it could have been a wake-up call with COVID for, for one of us to be well. We all have to be well. But it, it became so polarized that that yeah. message didn't land with a lot of people. And it's gone the other way back when, when um, in the uh, first parts of this, of the last century, the maximum tax was 90%, maximum tax uh, rate. And it's been cut to whatever it's been cut to. It's gone the other way yes. because of politics. And back to this term limits and what campaign finance and staying in office, which, uh, you know, you're, you're rich. If you help me stay elected, I'll make sure you stay rich. That's the deal. And it's gotten, gotten worse. Yeah, last There's disparity between CEO pay and your average worker's pay. You know, the problem is, and it goes to what you would, we were mentioning, we as a society lionize these people that they're gaining all this money, have all this money, these CEOs are, you know, they're great. Trump, he makes all this money, and even though he, he may not, you know, we don't know. But, but, but they say, oh, he makes all this money. We lionize him, you know? And, and I think what the auto workers are doing right now, they're going on strike, and they're, they're, they're shaming the, the CEOs. So it's Kaiser. And that's what they ought to do. That's what we should do. We should, we should, they should be shamed rather than lionized. Yeah. Don't you think too, if you, if you think back, that after every great, after, and I don't know if I have it all accurate, but after Roosevelt, the country joined together after the Depression to reunite. They did the same thing after Johnson with the Great Society. People were working for common good for the entire country. Even whatever your politics, even after the World Trade Center, people seemed to work together, seemed to, and although there were disparities, they had some common good, some common cause. But, but now it's so divided that the inequities in all areas get greater and greater and greater and greater. Not only the monetary inequities, but all of them. You know, education, justice, all of it. Because there's me and you. It's us and them. And I don't know if you can put that back, that back, you know, it's the old saying, can you put the toothpaste back in the tube? It is so great now, and the inequities are so great, and the divisions are so great, and the money is so great. You know, when you have somebody, when you gave the, the, the auto workers, I believe <laughs> the, the woman who's in, who, her salary went up like 40%, she makes like, Thirty-two million dollars a year. One hundred and seventeen thousand yeah, dollars a year. Yeah, and, 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 and now I will give credit to some of the unions. Whenever the writers went out, they were out for five months, and unions yeah. seemed to be strong then. To your point, and I'm going to make this give this thought. I like these metaphors and pictures. How many of you are gluten free? How many what? Gluten free. Gluten -free. You know about gluten? It's really yes. sorry. I'm sorry. If you try to bake something that doesn't have the gluten in it, it doesn't stick together. <laughs> the gluten, <laughs> gluten for me was the middle class, the big middle class, the, the center. You know, we kept talking about this in this last election, well, the center hold. Remember that last? Mm -hmm. The gluten, it was the middle class. They're not there anymore. You have the, you have the extremes on this side. Streams on that side. We don't have anything to say to you. Yeah. There's no, no, no basis for discussion. And when we vote, it's going to be us versus you. And not this middle that's going to actually be the group to make the decision. Mm -hmm. The gluten that mm -hmm. held us together. I don't know, just a thought. Uh, because if Mel keeps trying to make things without gluten, then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. People. Once again, looking out for everybody. Yeah. You want your daughter to get well. sick? <laughs> well, yeah. I was just using it to make a point about 
pulling together. I mean, yeah, it just yeah. seems like, and you think, you know, hopefully, maybe not in our, my lifetime, but hopefully it will come somewhat full circle. Hopefully there'll be a point whenever power doesn't become as important and, you know, it just mm -hmm. seems just so extreme. Mm -hmm. And it seems to get worse and worse with all of it, education, schools. I mean, states now banning books, voucher systems, so good schools remain good, poor schools remain poor. You know, we're making, getting bigger and bigger about what we do here. And there's a lot of Gen Z's more. out there and they're voting. Pardon? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of gen Generation Z's out there and they're voting. We're the mm -hmm. parents of one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're, yeah. they're, they're aware and they're concerned. Yeah. Well, you see this book here, it's, it's about our first civil war and the title is meant to suggest Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got another the one. <laughs> Actually, the first one wasn't the first one anyway. It was the Revolutionary War. It was a civil war. And there have been several since. But it's the next one that this book says hey, what went on back then? Uh, the dysfunction in government. Not my president. They said that mm -hmm. about Lincoln. So many states uh, actually didn't even have him on the ballot right before the Civil War. So very similar circumstances to today in some, some ways. And so the, the, toward the end of that book, the, 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 the protagonists get into this discussion about, hey, I wonder if this could ever happen again. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it was fun, fun writing it uh, from that uh, perspective. Other thoughts about what to do? We gotta have well, solutions before we can leave here today. Okay, well, employee-owned co-ops. You know, like, yeah. you know, you need to democratize the workplace and, you know, obviously unionization, that's part of it. But, you know, basically, if the employees own the means of production, you know, that, you know, that certainly is very empowering. And, you know, certainly, hopefully, you can lead a lot more creative solutions to problems, you know, than instead of people just be like, you know, employees being passive receptacles of what the owners tell them. Yeah. I am. Uh, I work at Verizon. And one contract year, this guy, he probably got in trouble for doing this. He's like, he sends out this email and he says, Oh, poor Verizon, you really got to work with us because, you know, um, we can't be spending all this money, blah, 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 you know, in, in essence. And I'm like, With salaries? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, whatever. You know. And I'm like, well, just go sell a couple of your big houses or, you know, a boat or something. You know, the money's there. You just are hoarding it. <laughs> yeah. Yes? I think uh, uh, I think you had a good point. This, this hero worship of rich people, this lionization of rich people, it has to stop. You know, we have got, we have got a very unhealthy way of looking at people that make a lot of money in this country. Taylor Swift is a great example. Okay, she's got up to work, they're taking in a billion dollars. What does that prove? Does that make her any more special than a musician in Johnstown who's very talented working in a band? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that's what happens. We, we start to hero worship these people. We start to elevate them to a, uh, a position where they can, they, can, they can make us feel that we don't have a value. That they, they have all the answers. They have all the. Uh, uh, Would you like some cheese? I want to say, but they have all the answers, and I think you know we need to do that. I, the only way I can see that we can control this right now is legislation, because I don't think you can just convince people out of the goodness of their hearts to give up their trillion dollar salaries, and you know it's not going to happen. Uh, we have to have some. We have to have some way of getting the control back uh, of our government to our people and and out of the hands of these very wealthy people. One of the things that they do is this, this whole uh, lobbying process they have. It's outrageous. And we allow it, we kind of turn our heads, we don't pay attention to it, but it's there. And it's going on, and they have billions and billions of dollars at their disposal, and they buy people, and basically that's all there is to it. And we have to understand what a powerful, motivating factor money is. It's huge, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. So unless we can come together and really pass legislation, put enough pressure on our politicians to pass the legislation that we need, I don't see, I think that's what we're gonna need the next time. I'm afraid, I don't wanna see it, but I'm afraid it might happen. Yeah. Well, you know, when I say, uh, 
in capitalism, raw, the thing is worth what you can get for it. <clears throat> that sort of sounds okay, in a way. But when the system is stacked <laughs> so that only certain people can get what they get for it, because of the position they hold, or the part of the structure they're in, that's when it, that's when it uh, becomes problematic as I see it for it. Well, you had a great example of that, that IPO. The fact that these people could buy the stock a day before everybody else, that's just outrageous. Yeah. And, and, and we all kind of put up with it. We go, oh, well, they're wealthy. Somehow they deserve this kind of privilege. I know. You know, they only deserve it because they have a bunch of money. That's why they deserve it. You know, see a lot of them. Well, someone would point out that in that group of <clears throat> investors on day one, there were big, um, they, they were retirement funds that were in that too. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like it was just all that clean and, and neat. But you got the idea that right. some people couldn't get access to it because they weren't in a retirement pension fund. But the anymore. managers of the funds make big salaries too, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Right. Yes, sir. So, <clears throat> so it didn't get any discussion when I, when I talked about uh, teaching values and ch changing our, our value system. <laughs> Since you literally wrote the book on morality, <laughs> what, what, what ideas do you have on like how to infuse? How do we infuse that? How do we? Well, <laughs> do you think we should? The question is where morality comes from. Uh, is is one thing. How to use it in a society like ours, and how to apply it. What what's it mean to be moral in a complex society like ours is, is still another one. And of course, we, you, can, you see the jokes are on, in, uh, on the uh, internet every day, you know. Uh, how is it, uh, what was the one today? It was about uh, being, being a good Christian and it had to do with you can it's okay to ban books because of your belief in Christianity, but it doesn't matter that kids don't have lunch. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the same people making the argument. So it's like selective use of, I want to take care of other people. I'll decide how to do that, I guess. Um, there are over 300, 350, I think, is the number. Uh, excerpts in the Bible about taking care of the poor, mm -hmm. 350. And a lot of the folks who are on the side of, well, we can't do any more of this welfare stuff come from that, that heritage. I mean, it's, I don't know the answer to your question. How do you, how do you apply it? I just know as a biologist where that comes from is, is, is first and foremost the fact that we got where we are as a highly collaborative species. We, it's not about, it's not about um, anything other than our, as, as we've evolved as a species from little bands, family groups, bigger groups, countries. And we were headed toward a global uh, thing at one point, and which of course is um, something that many conservatives just abhor. America only, or America first. We don't want to do this global stuff. The UN should be resolved. Uh, our history as a species and its success is because of increasingly, our ability to increasingly collaborate more effectively. All of our inventions have come from the fact that farmers can support hundreds of other people each. That leaves us, others, to do other things. And that's when it all began, this big rise of our species as the most successful one by most standards. And why people don't get that, I don't know. But they don't seem to grasp that. It, it's like that gold bar thing. It takes other people. Right. It takes other people to make a world. You, you, you're by yourself with your wealth. That metaphor of Scrooge McDuck with his money men. Uh, you know. <laughs> and what, what, there's some other ones like that. Uh, General Bull Moose, who back in the... I mean, it's hardly arguable. It, it is. There's a lot of money wasted. It's spent for things that should have expired years ago. And, you know, the argument that well, I don't want to pay taxes because 
I'm, I'm a better judge of what to do with my money than the government is. So the, the uh, politicians will be building airplanes that the mm -hmm. Pentagon doesn't even want. All right. You know, yeah, stuff like that, because my constituents need to work. Stuff like that gets into this uh, mix. Yeah, so it, it's what retards the movement in the direction here, all those kinds of things. Yeah. So I just wanted to make a comment. Um, in the past maybe five or more years, I've seen a lot of alternative economies arise. Um, I'm speaking from someone who is in not the $5 billion wellness industry, <laughs> but works in wellness in, in communities where there's sliding scale options available for people. And, and um, where you have a suggested contribution um, and, a, and a pay it forward. And I've been using that model for about five or six years and have found it to be very effective. And a lot of the organizations, um, uh, especially during COVID, a lot of organizations took that model um, and allowed people to access ed like educational programs and things like that. And, and I think that that model has, has grown and, and is, a, is an example of like just doing it, you know, for, for organizations that have the capacity to do that. Um, but it, it's, 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 and what I've found personally is that like the people that can pay it forward do. And the people that don't have the full amount will pay what they can. And that's, that's a model that I've learned to trust. I mean, I'm not in that billionaire class <laughs> that you referenced up there, but, but, yeah. not <laughs> but, but, it, but it, you know, we do have, I think things need to happen at all these different levels, but they can have, we can make change what, what, what is in, in our wheelhouse to do, you know? Um, so I don't know, I just want to make that happen. Yes, sir. Several years ago, many years ago, the late Carl Sagan persuaded NASA to turn the Voyager spacecraft around on its way to Jupiter. <coughs> and it took a picture back toward the sun. And in that picture, slightly off to the right of the sun, is a little speck it looks almost like a spot of dust on the negative. He called it a moat of dust, yeah. That is the Earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And if more people would look at that and realize what's there, that's it. Yeah, the whole story. Right. That's it. That little pale dot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It puts it in perspective. It does indeed. It's a great metaphor and a real picture. I think I have it on the wall back yeah. home. Yeah. Sir? Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, the whole profit-focused economic system of capitalism that we're living under is, is sort of doomed like slavery, the slavery system had been in the past and the, feudal, the feudalism economies of the past. They worked real well for a while until they didn't work anymore. And ours isn't working anymore for growing numbers of people. Uh, all the stuff you posted is, is evidence of that. And I think that, that just every, everything you see, uh, healthcare is turning into more and more of a profit-focused yep. system. Doctors used to be well-respected. Now they're, now they're whipped to, to okay. perform and, mm -hmm. and see more patients every day so that they can hustle money for the privatized healthcare system. Uh, you know, all of that uh, just can't work. And, and when you look at, at uh, what keeps a system running, the, 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 the only way the corporate interests can make profit is by reducing the amount of labor that goes into their overhead costs. And so they're using artificial intelligence and robotics and all kind of things like this. It ought to benefit all of us, but it doesn't. It, it instead uh, uh, is cutting back. I mean, even if it does that, if they're able to cut back wages, reduce them way down, uh, that's the market that's buying. We are the market that's buying the products that they need to sell. And our gross domestic product is 70% uh, is consumer spending. Uh, so if they if they're concerned about that, like that every everybody having more money would be would boost the economy.
but I think they're short-sighted enough that it won't work, and I don't think it'll work until there's some major revolt, you know, some major re rebellion. Uh, you know, maybe unions getting much stronger. And, yeah, because this seems to be uh, too resistant to change that needs to be done. It is. Yes. So it, yeah. it, it breaks. You know, I haven't mentioned, none of us mentioned immigration. Mm -hmm. I, but I did present global statistics here <laughs> that tell me and should tell you and everybody. Is it any wonder if people want to leave where they are in some of these places where they make a dollar mm -hmm. ninety a day or have a dollar ninety a day? If that were me, or any one of you would go to some other place. Now, if you get make a dollar ninety a day, you probably have to walk, so you're not going to get very far, right? But there are those that have other means of getting there, and we're seeing them actually walking across our border now every day. Well, I don't know what happens if we finish the wall and we stop them. All that pent up stuff is still there. Right. It's going to pop up somehow. Somewhere, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, do you yeah. think yourself, even what we're seeing now, how can we sustain that? You know, I mean, as, all the intentions are great. Everything is great. But how can you possibly sustain that right now? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at cities like New York and Chicago and that, they just, they're not able to sustain it. They're yeah. just not. And, and biologically, the world seems to have realized at least one solution to this, which is lower birth rate. Um, it's, it's been happening for decades now all over the world, and it was made possible by uh, science, of course, and, um, and, and the, uh, in fact, us as a country now, we're not even replacing ourselves anymore, but globally, it's been remarkable how fast birth rate went from, in some countries, from uh, uh, whatever it was to almost what it is here. But today, listen to this. There are three people per second added to the earth right now, today. That's the rate, that's the birth rate we have today. After all this reduction has taken place. So that's three people per second. Every one of those taps is a new person. That's above the death rate. That's net growth in global population. That's happening today, too. So it's not going to get any smaller, <laughs> at least for a little while. Maybe it will eventually. But at some point, it has to be sized enough so we can get at it and actually do something to raise all these uh, boats. But as I, as I sit here and, and talk about this, and I know there's no way that 8 billion people are ever going to get to the standard of living we have on this blue dot with all the limitations that that, that means. It's not going to happen. There will have to be either a fewer people or be different ways of doing living on this planet. Some pretty profound stuff to think about. Yeah. Well, some some European countries, you know, they're having lowered birth rates, but you know they don't want to admit. Some some countries they even try paying their paying some families to have more babies. In certain country, wealthy countries, you know, of course, immigration that's one solution, but you know, a thorny one. Yeah. So I just mean all the old people are screwed because there's. <laughs> there are only going to be a bunch of old people. <laughs> no <Well>. young people. <laughs> I'm trying to, I've got to find a way to leave this, to end this with an upbeat uh, somehow. But at least there, here we are having a discussion about this. I don't know how much of this is going on, but I hope there's more. Uh, and eventually, you know, maybe enough of a critical mass of folks that get it and that see that uh, we have to keep working, looking for these. Solutions, even though some of the problems, I'll admit, I'm, I've already admitted, are intractable. Right. Mm -hmm. But not addressing them or discussing them, they remain. At least yeah. well, some few people critically think. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank all of you for being part okay. of the discussion tonight. Thank you so much for being mm -hmm. here. Thank you. All right, I'll put, in, I'll put in a plug for my book. You know, I talked about poverty in the area and African American life expectancy in the 60s in the county here.
So do you have a free book to give away today, Paul? I do not, but they do have copies on the shelf. Well, that's, that's better. They do have copies on the shelf. Yes, you can.